Hello, everybody. Welcome to Kitab e Club. This live is special for us for many reasons. First, it is the hundredth live we are hosting, and it is that we are hitting a century. For a special live, you need a special book, and that too, some special guest. Here we are with the editors of Masterpieces at the Jaipur Court. I'm sure we all are intrigued by the royalty. What goes behind the closed curtains? What happens in the riches and the kingdoms? But how many times, when you have visited a museum, you have really looked into the artifacts, into the pieces which are displayed there? Looked per se means rather looked into detail. Before I introduce my guest for today, let me just show you a couple of pictures and the images from the book and what we are going to discuss today. Okay, this looks interesting. Uh, I'm sure. we must be thinking what is this this looks i don't know maybe maybe like a cup to me or maybe like a bowl to me i am going to ask my guest for the day what is this all about at the same time let me introduce my guest dr milani is museum consultant to the msms to museum trust she has published widely on the history of photography in india Her work has been supported by the Cambridge Trust, Rajiv Gandhi Foundation, JN Tata Endowment, Royal Asiatic Society, and Royal Asiatic Society and Royal Historical Society, among others. She is the recipient of a Leverham Early Career Fellowship at Royal Holloway University of London. What an incredible feat you have, Narini! Welcome to Kitab e Club. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yes, um, Dr. Giles. has been consultant director research publications and exhibitions at the msm2 museum since 2011 he was earlier reader in history of art at the school of oriental and african studies university of london and is also a fellow and former director of the royal asiatic society london he has written and edited many books on the indian architecture history and landscape including jaipur nama tales from the pink city and as curated exhibitions in jaipur delhi mumbai and new york he is currently senior vice president museums exhibitions for dag new delhi welcome to kitab e club dr charles thank you very much for this <laughs> it is it is an honor to host you both and talk about your recently edited book recently recently released book masterpieces at the jaipur court before we go further i have a question to ask you I mean, I'm, I have a question to ask both of you. You know, when it comes to the museum, there are so many exhibit pieces which are you know displayed, like painting, photography, textiles, arms, armor, heritage objects, and there are in total seventy six pictures or images or objects you talk about in the book. How do you select those? Um, you know, seventy six. Doctor Manani, would you like to answer first? Sure, please follow me. um it was a combination of methods uh there are some objects that um i think everyone uh recognizes as a masterpiece usually because we think things that are expensively made you know if they use precious materials or metals or inlay or gold and stuff like this we tend to think oh wow it's a masterpiece because it was really expensive to to, to produce uh, or like the images on your screen really difficult to produce beautifully intricately made um so those were those are some of the obvious ways in which everybody not just scholars but everybody thinks of these things as masterpieces uh, but we also are very fortunate in the huge range of you know um uh scholarship that the collections attract so we get a lot of scholars from india as well as around the world uh who come to research the collections because you know they're interested in specific things um and so we we learned a lot from them so we saw what they were interested in you know things that i don't know anything about but you know if you come and tell me oh this is special for this reason and did you know x or y about this and we don't so we think oh how interesting and together they tell us so much more about uh the court as a whole and the ways in which um the jaipur court uh supported art or uh supported the pursuit of knowledge uh you know uh, whichever way you want to put it or look at it um and so we it was it was using a combination of these methods um that we that we came up with the selection for the book 
to be very honest i thought that uh, being expensive is what you know being intricate is what gets you into the book but you have changed my perception about it what would you add to it dr giles yes i think the collaboration is the key because um people bring very different perspectives and obviously we have a lot of visitors to the museum I mean, just tourists and 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 travelers who who come but there are also scholars who come specifically for their own research uh, purposes and very often they have areas of expertise which we lack i mean even with a the, well the staff of the museum is small but and we're diverse but even if we pool all of our knowledge we can't cover everything um and so when you have someone who's a specialist often is something you know really really recondite really highly specialized and they can tell you something that you didn't know about an object that's in your in your collection and so when we set about uh, designing this book thinking about this book many museums around the world you know do their their favorite things you know their 100 best objects or whatever but they're usually chosen by the the staff of the museum themselves we felt that we'd learned so much from scholarly visitors that we would actually ask them to participate that we would write to them and say could you please choose one or two things and you tell us why that masterpiece is in 500 words and so the the the, the book they were edited by the two of us is actually written by more than 40 people um, who are, so you get completely different perspectives. You know, some of them, they really don't connect up with each other at all. They only connect through Jaipur. And that's the point of the book. Very true. You know, different um, different contributors to the book bring a perspective, phenomenal perspective to the entire Jaipur code, to the way the entire book is presented. I really, uh, you know, resonated with the fact when you said that the books, uh, the museums have 100 famous pieces, but then contributors, really showcase story. Very true on that. Uh, this brings me to my second question rather. Like Masterpieces of the Joe Court includes articles by many eminent authors, international experts. And uh, you know, as an insider, I would like to know how long did you took to you know compile this entire uh, collaboration? Because 40 authors means it is like 40 books in one book together. Really. Well, yes, I, it, it down by COVID, unfortunately. But um, I think we, we originally thought of it about three or four years ago. And to, to get to begin with, we put it together quite quickly, and then the production was was slowed down by by COVID. But it helped that the people we were reaching out to were already familiar with the collections and had ideas about um, what they what they wanted to write about. So, and of course, every time someone new came to look at something new, we said, "Ooh, can we get an entry from you?" So, we I'm afraid we added to the problem because you know the book kind of enlarged. We started with fifty, it became seventy five, and then I managed to get a last minute contribution from somebody. You know, literally before the the editorial team started started working on it. So, so we we added to uh, uh, the process, but I think the book is richer for it. So. Yeah. Uh, uh, were there any last minute calls, you know, panic calls that, okay, we need to stop now. We have touched 50. Now we are crossing 70. Did ever that happen to you or you wanted to keep on adding? The 76 is just a number for you. Oh, I think oh. there's so much scope. Um, it's very hard to stop. Um, it's really a question of, you know, some people whom we asked had other commitments, so they weren't able to uh, uh, contribute. Um, uh, and other people, the last minute ones were people who first said no, but then because we hadn't, because of COVID, as Jazz mentioned, there were delays. Mm. And so because it had taken longer than planned, I wrote to them a year or two later saying, you know, we're, now we're going to press. Do you still have no time or can you can you fit it in? And some people very generously said yes. Oh, Giles, do you disagree to this by any chance? You are, you are like 76, we should stop or you were like, we should go to at least 100. Oh, no, no. Yeah, but Giles said, no, we need to keep it... Uh, uh, the, the idea was to keep it portable. You see, we, we, we've done a number of other books beforehand, which were much yeah. more on parts of the collection. We have a, a, a book on the Arms and Armour collection alone, written by one specialist, that's 300 pages. We have two books on the textile collections by two different specialists. I mean, to give, put this in perspective, the, the textile collection alone has 3,000 objects. The photograph collection yes. has a thousand objects the paintings collection has over three thousand objects so to choose 76 across the whole range including manuscripts and buildings and 
sculpture, you know, it's extraordinarily difficult um, to, 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 to make a selection. So I think really we were choosing people, we were choosing contributors, people who had engaged in interesting and, and original ways um, with the collection so that we could hear their voices and, and look at their, their selection. I mean, that's what is reflected very well in the book also. When you are talking about different kind of articles, objects, or artifacts mentioned in the book, Milani, I want to ask you, there is a lot which is mentioned about uh, the Janana, if I'm pronouncing it right, or the Hamans of the uh, Mughal, Mughal kings, and which is, which is not known, which is not uh, information everybody is privy to. So how was, um, you know, getting that information, or how did you get that data, what you needed for the book? Uh, we, we, you've asked about the Zanana, so a lot of the, uh, I think really the, the, the major references to that in the book are in the form of the photographs of the women who um, would have okay. lived in it or, uh, you know, used it. And um, there's a lot that we don't know. I mean, there's a lot that we know, but there's also a lot that we don't know, because um, we know that Savai Ram Singh the second was a really... Uh, talented photographer and well known in his day, even though it um, uh, sort of uh, receded from public knowledge for for about a hundred years after his death, and it was in the eighties that we that uh, we, we became aware of it, uh, his, his body of work again. Um, so uh, you know, and and we know that he was an, uh, he was a he was a talented photographer. We know about you know his life and career in terms of you know when he became the Maharaja of Jaipur. What are the things that he did? He's of course famous for also being a reformer. He built schools and hospitals and all of the things that uh, were starting to become the fashion in some parts, in some princely uh, 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 courts in India uh, at that time. We're talking about the mid to late nineteenth century. Um, uh, and so we, we have all of those details. We also have some idea of the people whom he met and his interest in photography, but we don't know, for example, who, you know, did he learn by himself? Did someone teach him? Uh, we also don't know how, you know, uh, the Zanana, the women in the Zanana, mm -hmm. because a lot of their portraits are in the collection. That's actually one of the unique aspects of, of the, the collection is that there are so many portraits and so many of them are of women. Um, but we don't necessarily know how they were used. So, you know, did the, what did the women do with these pictures or did they have access to them at all? Were they on display somewhere? Who was seeing them? Who, so there's a lot that we don't know. So some of the, uh, but that can also be fun. It can also be liberating in the sense that it forces us to think, to speculate, um, to try and imagine uh, the kind of impact that uh, this new technology would have had because uh, very early on when, when the, the, the camera came to India quite quickly and it was, mm. we tend to think of um, uh, that, you know, Europe is far away, but actually within uh, uh, weeks or months, technological innovations could and did move around in different directions, not just Europe to India, but in, in both directions. Mm. Um, but the camera was in India quite early in the 19th century and um, in, in, in the very early days, uh, people thought that, you know, it would steal your soul. So how do, how do, how did, how did these women who, some of whom, not all of them, but some of whom may have never really known a life outside the walls of a Zanana, how did they respond to this Maharaja suddenly saying, oh, you know, I need you to, um, pose or, you know, so there's a lot that we don't know, but it forces us to also, uh, uh, take imaginative leaps um, uh, to try and imagine the worlds which which these objects represent. I, you know, I am so um, connected with what you said because when I was reading the book, I, you know, I actually teleported to the century, uh, that particular era where I thought, okay, what would have happened after it? This image looks like, okay, how that the person could think about it. That was my thought entirely while reading uh, those particular pages. Um, Giles, my next question would be to you that, um, you know, some unique manuscripts like from the museum's collection have been highlighted in the book, such as Yog Bhaskara, Rekha Ganitam, uh, Mushu Garib. I, I hope I'm doing justice to the words. Can you tell us something more about the unique features of these manuscripts? Because these are something not which I have heard of, rather, I would say. Yeah. The, the manuscripts for <laughs> are particularly challenging, I think, because um, 
if you don't read the language, they may have to you at all. I mean, obviously, an illustrated manuscript is something different. You can look at the pictures. Mm. But the museum has an enormous library of manuscripts in a variety of languages, Sanskrit, Rajbhasha, Persian. Um, and how do, you, how do you make those accessible to an audience that, that doesn't know those languages? And actually quite a large number of the scholars who come to us individually to work with us or to work for their own research purposes, it's the manuscripts that they're interested in. And by talking to them, it begins to unlock part of what these manuscripts are about. Sometimes, you know, we didn't know about them at all, really, because, you know, we don't, ourselves don't know the languages sufficiently well. And, and when you talk to them individually, and then you connect their stories, you begin to get a picture that you can tell to a general audience. Let me explain that a little bit. So you mentioned the Rismali Isahadiya. So this was a, a, a manuscript that um, was looked at by uh, Supriya Gandhi uh, for us. Yes. Um, it's, it, it, it actually, we were trying to show her the painting on the other side. It was one of those very um, just fortuitous moments. You know, we were showing her a painting. She wasn't terribly interested in it. She turned it over and she said, but there's some calligraphy on the back in Persian. And she started to read it. And she said, you know, it, it's, it's an extract from a text that's um, a memoir written by Jahanara, the daughter of oh, Shah. Yes. That's part of her spiritual quest into Sufism. Um, and this is an extraordinarily rare thing. I mean, the, 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 there's a modern version of the text that was published based on a manuscript that's now lost. So we think we have the only surviving original copy of that, that, that manuscript. So that's, that's one thing that we have. But then you connect that up, there's, a, there's another manuscript which actually connects with Jahanara's brother, Dara. There's a mm -hmm. famous treatise where he, he goes to talk not to a Sufi, though he shared the same devotion to the same Sufi master as his sister, but there's an occasion when he was talking to a, a Hindu yogi, and it's a, it's a form of question and answer. They're all, he's asking him about spiritual matters. And this is a text that was normally written in Persian, but we have a version of that in our library in Sanskrit. It's called the, the Prashna Taravani. You'll excuse my terrible Sanskrit pronunciation. So these two, brother and sister, on different spiritual quests, you know, uh, and, in, and expressed in different languages, sitting on adjacent shelves in the same library. And on the next shelf, there's this thing you also mentioned, the Yoga Bhaskara. With that, that's a, that's a, a Sanskrit manuscript on, on an aspect of yoga, which... Uh, was discovered, as it were, what it actually is was discovered by a Sanskritist from, from London uh, called Jim Mallinson, um, who's also a yoga uh, expert. Um, and he said, you know, well, th th there are many references to this text in other medieval works on yoga, but nobody's actually found the original text. But you've got it. Now, you put those three stories together, I mean, they're, they're each wow moments in the history of scholarship for each of the three individual scholars. But for us sitting in Jaipur, we think, hang on, this tells us something about Jaipur. It tells us about the extraordinary world that it lived in, that it was capable of engaging simultaneously with medieval ideas about yoga in Sanskrit and with the different spiritual quests of two members of the Mughal imperial family. And they're in Jaipur, because of course Jaipur was a, a major state, a major component part of the Mughal Empire. What an extraordinarily rich, intellectually rich and diverse world the Mughal world was, and that Jaipur was a part of, that these three very different manuscripts are all in the same room. That, for me, is the excitement. I mean, for them, it was their individual discoveries. For us, it was, here's a story we can tell the public about what Jaipur was in the 18th century. Brilliant, you know. Uh, I am. Uh, I have read so many novels on novels. I'll use the word very correctly. Novels on the Mughal, you know, the Mughal history, the kings, the queens, and Janara is not a new name for me. But when you mentioned, rather, when I was going through the book and about the spiritual side, I thought that okay, this. This existed, this side of her existed, I didn't know. Like what you said, that it was a revelation in itself, that is so true because when I started reading it, I realized that, okay, this is something, I mean, you know, this is something terrific. I should research to read more on it. That was, that was something, you know, my Eureka moment in the book. Uh, 
So moving further, Mirani Neem, you know, this book features historic maps of several locations, including Jaipur, Surat, Badrinath, and the Red Fort. Red Fort is something that I don't know how, how this information was brought to light, but then, you know, what these maps tell us about the people of the time and their awareness of the larger world around them, because everything we have at this point is, you know, on Google, everything is on our phone and fingertips. But then when it comes to uh, these maps, how did you, you know, how you found it? What was your experience while, okay, the map exists about the Red Fort during those times? Well, I think that is especially interesting because of the way in which it's made. Uh, and we had, uh, again, we, we sort of, we had, um, uh, if I remember, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we were, uh, that map is on display in the gallery in the museum on painting and photography. And Ooh. we were, uh, restoring it, like conserving it, not restoring it. We were conserving it, just cleaning it up and stabilizing it and stuff. And it so happened that there was, uh, at that point he was doing his PhD. He is now at Berkeley, I think, a, a scholar called Abhishek Kekar. Um, okay. And he just happened to kind of come to Jaipur and, you know, he wanted to try and see if he could look at things and he sort of wandered past and we were looking at this because the conservator was there and we were having a conversation. And his, his area of expertise is, um, Delhi um, and so we said oh come and look at this at, at, uh, Mughal Delhi particularly so we said oh you know come and look at this and uh, lots of really fascinating things emerge so uh, well the short answer to your question is how do we find this information out we get really lucky and we have brilliant scholars come and visit us and so we learn from them um, but the long answer is that he you know the, if you look very closely it's ruled um, you know the it's the sort of like a handmade graph paper and so it's quite precisely measured. And all of the, uh, uh, the different bits of the fort are labeled in Devnagri. So it together, what they tell us is that whoever made this map, and actually a lot of the maps and plans that you're referring to, rough, most of them date from Savaiya Singh the second's reign, not all, but the, many of the ones that you've referred to. Um, but they tell us a, a lot about the incredible proximity, the access you know, to power that Jaipur had, to the central power that Jaipur had, because in order for him to have, to be able to commission someone to go and basically do a measured drawing of the Red Fort, can you imagine you or I just wandering into Rashtrapati Bhavan to do a measured drawing? Like you need access, right? You need yeah, yeah. to get to the top. Um, and they also need to have your confidence, um, you know, that you're not going to do something dodgy. Um, and 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 but also the fact that it's all labeled uh, uh, in Devnagri also tells us that it's for the Jaipur court's consumption. So this is a Jaipur object made for the Jaipur court, but of the Red Fort. It's a plan of the Red Fort, and we think that because there are so many maps and plans that date to Jaisingh's period. So you also mentioned the Surat map. Um, yes. Surat is a planned port city. Um, so we think that because Jaipur was, of course, founded in 1727, the historic capital was Amer, so, um, you know, which, which predates it. And we think that he was using a lot of these as kind of homework, not homework, research, um, to help them uh, think about. So we're not saying that, you know, we, we all look at the world around us for inspiration. So we're not saying that, you know, this is, Jaipur is based on this city or that plan or as a copy of this, no. Um, but just as we all look around us for uh, uh, inspiration, we, we think that um, these maps hint at a similar sort of process where he's just getting a sense of what are, what these other major trade and imperial cities look like and uh, that he that it informs his thinking uh, uh, in, 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 in his plans for Jaipur. Very true, because access to these kind of places, to uh, what, uh, you know, that what the measurements would be, the interpretations is a task in itself. And uh, that comes out really well in the book, because that has intrigued me. I'm sure there is a lot more data available on what is in the book, but then this intrigues, this generates my interest. Um, Giles, my next question to you is, there's, um, uh, there is, you know, a mention of the courtesans at the uh, Jaipur court or... Uh, or rather in the book you talk about bhaktans okay and uh, so what role did they play basically or the professional women performance rather i would say so what they what was their role at the court 
Well, this comes up because of the inclusion of a couple of drawings, um, which were, yes. they're actually on the loop if you want to go back. I don't know if yes. you can find yes, them. Yes. That, that's the Bafasurit, but um, um, yeah, till they come. That, no, so it's pause there, go back one, go back a this couple. One. No, no, this one? Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. so these are a couple of drawings. So, so these perhaps for some might challenge our definition of of masterpiece in the sense they're not they're not you know as it were grade A works of art but they're they're, they're intimate drawings, um, the on the left of a courtesan and singer at the court um, Rani Bhagtan, and on the right a pencil sketch of um, two musicians um, one playing the one on the right playing an instrument that's a little bit like a sarangi. Um, and the other one, um, the nearer man playing a, a, a double-headed drum, a bit like a dolak. Um, now, in Indian court painting of this period, this is the, these are from these, these date from around 1800, the end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century. All over India, this period, you're getting endless paintings of dancers and musicians and so on performing to the raja. They're usually rather idealized. They're usually rather generalized. Even the ruler himself might be rather idealized. So it's just a, a typical court scene with court performers. What makes these stand out? And the reason that these were selected for the book actually by um, uh, an eminent historian of Indian musicology um, based in London called Catherine Butler Schofield. And she chose them because these people are named, they're real people. Oh. We know, we know that this is Rani Bhagtan and the men are called Puran and Banwari, you know, because their names are inscribed. On, on. So this moves us to a whole different level. It gives us an insight into real people who were there. So, yes, I mean, I, it, it doesn't, they don't, as it were, tell us more about their lives or, 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 or their work, but it shows us them at a level of reality that you don't normally expect in people art. And actually, you'd link this to a, to, 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 a, to a question about a picture that's not on the loop, but I can talk a bit about. It's in it's it's in the book. In fact, I can I can pull it up um, if you go to need it. Yeah, so I mean, I also I'm also trying to take out that uh, page, but then somehow we, we call it a sacred dance. It's 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 a, it's a painting on an altogether different scale. This is a masterpiece by a very. Yes. Measure. This is a work by or attributed to the leading artist of the period of Pratap Singh at the end of the 18th century, a famous artist called Sahib Ram. Um, and it shows a performance at court of the Raj Lila. I and mean, it shows at the first glance, you think it's dancing with Radha until you notice that Krishna is actually a woman. So oh. it's actually Kortizan dressed as Krishna. Um, performing the sacred dance, and the, the 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 other attendant figures are musicians. They're singers and and instrumentalists uh, supporting them. So what Sahib Ram is depicting is is a representation of the Rasila as it would have been performed at court. And what makes this painting extraordinary and the masterpiece, unlike these two beautiful, intimate, tiny sketches, the painting. It's 13 feet wide, it's life size, six Goodness. feet over high. You know, the figures are full size. Um, and it's, it has to be one of the largest and most expensive paintings ever made in a Rajput court. It's just extraordinary. The gold in it is gold. I mean, they cost you gold, and it's gold. Um, so it's just an, an astounding, you know, eye watering masterpiece, but also intensely moving because it works on so many different levels because it's 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 it, yes at one level it is a painting of krishna and radha because of course the the girl as she performs becomes krishna she is blue she has the halo you know she she has the more mukha she has all of the attributes of krishna and yet at the same time she's just another colleague of the court artist sahib ram she's just another person at the court the the, the women musicians, when you look really closely, and as I say, these images are life-size, when you look really closely at the pictures, they all have palm-stained teeth. Because they're real people that he knew. I mean, he's idealized them, but at the same time, he's shown them with real attributes of, of, of people that he knew. And it's that, that sort of multi-layered level of 
work of art that astrologies means so much that it can be idealized and real at the same time. Um, these drawings, though, they're, they're just, just pure real. They're just real people talking to us over a period of centuries. Very true, you know, a, a painting showcasing something which is as real as what you mentioned is is what brings you, you know, face to face to that particular era. Giles, at the same time, I would like to ask you, since you mentioned that it is a 13 feet long painting and it is one of the most exquisite uh, you know, uh, paintings at the Jaipu court and otherwise in the royal families, do you think by any chance uh, these paintings influence the upcoming paintings like you know what has been in that century uh, does it impact in any way art like you know the art which is going to come in the future i think that the our painting and photography gallery you'll see the impact of the art of um the period of pratap singh does continue into later periods but it's always interestingly intersected by other things. I mean, you know, art can't stand still. And mm. what happens in the 19th century, just a couple of generations later, in the time of Ram Singh, is you start getting the influence of photography and a very interesting interaction. Photography does not replace painting. It interacts with it. Um, and it, 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 it happens both ways around, but it, it changes the way in which people think, artists think about space but also photographers themselves start to think about color and about texture. Um, actually, Manal has worked on this more than I have in other, in other courts as well, about the way in which these two art forms uh, creatively engage with each other. I mean, so, they yes, well. change. They continue to as well in the sense that we did a collaborative exhibition at JKK with the Al Qazi Foundation, which showcased works. I'm forgetting the name of the artist, Jazz. Perhaps you can help me out or it'll come back to us. Anyway, this is at JKK a couple of years ago in Jaipur, Jawahar Kala Kendra. Um, and that show was, uh, we co-curated that with Rahab Alana um, from the al -Khazi Foundation. And he had showcased the work of an artist, I'm terrible with names, whose name escapes me for the moment, but who was responding to um, early photography. So it, I, just to say that, you know, even, um, even as uh, art, in front of you, you know, influences what you make, um, it can do so a couple of hundred years later as well. You can, you know, they can provoke artistic responses. Uh, Milani, there is, you know, a question at the back of my mind, which is there since the very beginning. When we were having our conversation initially, you mentioned something about restoration of uh, or preserving or, uh, you know, uh, taking care of uh, an artwork or something like that you mentioned. And uh, there is uh, one part where you talk about an entire elephant suit being, uh, you know, restructured or remodeled or restored. Sorry, restored is the right word. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so then what is the entire process like, you know? Okay. So there is actually a distinction in the museum world between restoration and conservation. And what we go for is conservation, not restoration, uh, okay. which means something slightly different. Um, uh, it's more invasive, basically. Uh, whereas conservation, one's trying to stabilize an object and uh, essentially improve its health while keeping it the same. Uh, and we've, over the years, uh, you know, we we are, a, the, the trust is, is a, is a charitable institution so we're dependent on on to to do work like that we are dependent on people coming in and visiting and so of course in that sense COVID's been awful uh but we have over the years managed to conserve uh uh you know bit by bit important bits of the collection and the elephant armor was one of those um uh, sort of lucky chances because uh we we looked at it and we thought mm, not really sure about this and so we one of the things we like doing is and it's really good to be in jaipur because everybody comes to jaipur for the jlf so we regularly go hunting at the jlf and catch hold of whichever expert or scholar we want to come and look at something so we did that for the elephant armor because robert elgood happened to be there that that year uh and so we dragged him off and said okay can you come and take a look at this because we're, we're trying to work it out yes we can see that it's elephant armor but you know what more can you tell us about it? And uh, that's all. It's also a good example of, um, you know, the, just going back to an earlier question about how did we make the selection and decide things were masterpieces. 
So this this bit of armor is not a masterpiece because it's some ancient bit of elephant armor that's you know 500 years old. It's actually quite new in in you know in relative terms in the sense that it's uh, 19th century. Yeah. So okay. in that sense, it's so so that is obviously newer than something made three or four hundred years ago. Um, despite which, there are very few full sets in the world. Um, so the fact that it's you know relatively recent you know, okay, but it's still important for being a, a complete set. But it's also interesting for what it tells us about the um, production and consumption of this kind of stuff. So the armor that uh, in, in this, that's depicted or that's showcased in this book, it's not actually something that was used in battle, it's ceremonial. Okay. So it's not okay. because it's, and how, you, how, how he could tell was because of the, the way in which it had been put together. And because the plates were thinner than uh, it would be if it had been used for battle. So, um, and and then we got as we as we delve deeper into the subject, and you know we we did manage to get that conserved by by two Delhi-based conservators, um, uh, somebody whose uh, uh, expertise is on metal, and another one who's on textile, called Pankaj and uh, Smita Sharma. Um, we as we as we delved into the subject, uh, we also realized that Jaipur was known for being a place where you could acquire the sort of ceremonial stuff, like you could have it made in Jaipur, um, which in many ways, you know, it, it, Jaipur's uh, a reputation as a place where you can get anything made and, you know, uh, it'll turn out as a, as, a, as a center for art and design, uh, long predates this, of course, and we also know the city in, in that way. Um, but it was just interesting for us to learn this other aspect of it, because I think uh, there were a couple of uh, uh, suits of elephant armor that were commissioned by viceroys for imperial events and things like that. So this okay. is, a, this is a, a, a special object because because of all of these things, not necessarily because it's the oldest suit in the world of elephant armor, but it has these interesting uh, stories uh, associated with it and connections um, associated with it. Uh, Manali, you know this this is, you know this answers two of my personal queries that if in case I want to get my you know book autographed by you two in future I need to see you at the JLF then second thing <laughs> being true too and second thing being uh, you know Jaipur uh, because you mentioned COVID and the pandemic just before one week before the pandemic started I was in Jaipur three days I have uh, you know spent most of my time at the museums and it was a different uh, way of looking at it. And once I read the book, Masterpieces, now I am craving to go to Jaipur and look at each piece differently. I'm telling you, it is a 360 degree change. Well, I will certainly- well, I'm happy yeah. to hear that because that's what we wanted the book to do for, every, for all yeah. our visitors. Yeah, because uh, just moving across the museum as the bystanders and after reading it, I'm like, okay, it looks good. I move on to the next thing. It looks good. I move on to the next thing. Now I'm like, it has such a rich history background to it. I now want to research, read more about it. And I would certainly say thank you so much for it. Yeah. Um, you know, that, there is that, something that's the sort of thing that makes us happy, and you know, uh, makes makes all of the the challenges of of producing books and coordinating with forty people worthwhile. Oh, wow. Uh, that's fantastic. Um, you know, Giles, there is one thing I noticed that uh, whatever I am reading about, whatever before, you know, having this conversation with you, I was researching about, there is a lot which is being, you know, centered around Jaipur. Like you find such good museums in Jaipur. There is, um, you know, MSN, uh, the second, the museum, then there is... Um, there is other city palace museums and, and several other things. And there is a lot being done to preserve the heritage in Jaipur particularly. So uh, so how do you, you know, how do you see, uh, see this? What do you think about the steps which are being taken to preserve the heritage? Well, it's not a coordinated story, of course. The possibility for different historic buildings in and around Jaipur lies with different bodies, with different government bodies, with different private organizations and so on. Um, so yes, I mean, that one sees um, examples of expert conservation and indeed of restoration. Um, I mean, for example, the conversion or reuse of, of, of buildings, slightly different rules. I think perhaps in the case of 
architecture as, as with museum objects, referring back to Manalo's earlier comments that if a building is going to have a life, you know, it, it has to have a purpose and sometimes the historic purpose is lost, so it needs a new purpose. But I, I don't think I can summarize it in a single answer because the, 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 the story is too, too diverse. Um, what we felt uh, with regard to this book was that, with respect to the built heritage, was that we had to include it. We couldn't, we couldn't leave it out. Um, we are enormously privileged to work in a historic palace um, that has buildings ranging in date from the early 18th century to the 20th, um, and um, some of which are undoubtedly masterpieces. Um, and obviously, it would be a terrible mistake. I, partly, I, I felt this very strongly because of my own original interests. Early interests were more in architectural history than in, I came comparatively later to museum collections. Um, and so the buildings that house these collections are as important to me as the collections themselves. And some of the parts of the City Palace are undoubtedly masterpieces um, of architectural design. And so we wanted to include those in our in our register and those are partly what people come to see as well actually to be honest i mean they have come to see the buildings as well as well as the the paintings and and whatever that that that, that they contain so they are, they are they are fairly represented along with some buildings in other parts of the city for which museum trust has responsibility and those include um, particularly the chatteries the memorial cenotaphs of the former rulers at uh, gator and the maharani's chantries which are on the road towards Amer. So for example, you won't see um, the Jantar Manta, which everybody knows, obviously, but that's because that's not owned by the trust. So we wanted, so we, um, although of course, if you look at it kind of historically, um, all of these buildings are associated with the court because um, we're talking about a time span of several hundred years. I mean, at the end of the day, um, the state of Rajasthan and India are both relatively new. It's only 75 years, whereas we're talking about a history that goes back many hundred to hundreds of years. So in that also in that sense, although all of these buildings are connected with Jaipur and the court, uh, for the purposes of the book, we only focused on the buildings that the trusts actually either own or manage. So that's just to explain yeah. why some famous Jaipur buildings, like, you know, you, there was a photograph that you were showing of the Hava Mahal, or even yeah. the Amir Palace, you know, those are not included in the book, not because they're not, you know, intimately connected, but because we don't actually run them. We, as in the trust, doesn't actually run them. So, very true. Cool. So. Uh, you know, Giles, this uh, this comes across as a connected question that you know, uh, I see the role of museums changing, and uh, and certainly there is an essential need to preserve our cultural heritage for our current self also and for the future generation. So in the in the rapidly changing world, how do you see this fitting in? Or rather, why this should you know be taken care of? Can, can I jump in actually? Because I'm going to do something we didn't discuss and ask you the question. Because you are okay. supposed to come and talk to us about, talk to you about this book. So obviously you're interested in it. And you told us all about how your son was so fascinated by yes. uh, getting an art exhibition. Um, okay. So why does it matter to you? Because you know, people for people like us, it's like it's like trying to I don't know convince um, chefs that food is important or something. Like this is for us. This is like obviously this is not a question yes. that you know we need. We are committed. So in a sense, it doesn't matter what we think. It matters what everybody else thinks. So why would you you know why does it matter to you? Do you think? Um, okay. So what has happened was that. Uh, why and how I um, came to this book, because uh, to be very honest with you, for me, art was all about uh, arts and drawings. I'm pure, I'm a chartered accountant. So for, it's all, for me, it's all about numbers. So two months back, I was at uh, the, uh, you know, the Taj Mahal Palace uh, and, um, and my son was drawing a painting while he was having his lunch. I mean, he was uh, drawing something with his sketch pens and all. So one of the servers said to him that there is an art exhibit happening and, uh, you know, you should go and see. So he kept his lunch aside and he just ran to that side. And I was like, OK, what is happening? So we went there and plus the Taj Mahal Palace Mumbai. And I thought, OK, what this little chap of six is going to do? 
because I don't understand art. And that's what I thought that I have passed into him. He went there. He he spent almost around one and a half hour looking at just three paintings. And he's an overly enthusiastic child. And he made some observations, which uh, one of the, uh, I think so, he was the senior, uh, I, I don't remember the, uh, the designation, but Farheen was the name of the person uh, there at the desk. And he was astonished the way he observed a couple of paintings. And he got talking to him. And I was shook at that moment. And I realized that, okay, this this has, uh, you know, not, this, I have, you know, somehow let loose at an as an observation that paintings have impacted him differently. He noticed that, okay, there is a painting where the person is being shown as black. There is a reflection where I was pursuing it, okay, this looks beautiful. The next one looks beautiful. That was my observation. And then I realized that how a phenomenal change, a painting if or an art gallery, if looked at in a different manner, can bring in your thinking, in your perception about present and future and the past also. Because there were a lot of textures being used in those paintings and uh, he could see those and reflect upon, comment upon, where I was wondering, in my head, my mums were also there with me and I was wondering, what is he talking about? Is he understanding? Then the other person was telling me, um, the, uh, the guy who was there was telling me, please do not interrupt him, let him speak. Why you are saying that this is not what his age is about? let him decide and that I understood that okay art is something which brings out a different side of you no matter what you are six or my mom's are 16 so my mom and my mother-in-law so they were like okay this is what we also have never experienced so that way I certainly feel that this should be a common sight in India more and more museums more and more art exhibits open and available to people like us who don't understand it or rather not understand per se but have not experienced it because art is something like a therapy you need to experience it not just visually see it i mean i i took a lot of time of yours i would say no that's great um, i think and it's, it's really important to have this discussion uh, as you say not amongst the, between the people who are already kind of paid up subscribers to the idea that, you know, art and museums are important. I think it's more important to open up the conversation, uh, 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 you know, beyond beyond those those, those communities. And that's how I, I got in touch with you, you know, several ways I thought of, you know, getting in touch through you uh, about through various mediums, but uh, it just took me two months. Don't worry. It just took me two months to, <laughs> to connect with you finally and invite you for a conversation. Sorry, it's the extraordinary power that art has and the potential it has in education in enriching the way in which all of us, children, starting from children, perhaps especially with children, but you know, all of us to engage with the world, to engage with history, to engage with our identity, our, our, our past, our sense of who we are and where we've, where we've come from. So yes, obviously museums and art galleries have an extraordinary responsibility um, in that respect, but also you know, the power that goes with that responsibility, if I can invert the normal um, comment. So yeah, I'm delighted. But, uh, by your by your anecdote and uh, delighted that the journey that your son has started you on uh, you know since uh, i i would just like to take this one minute and uh, ask you a very different question altogether because it is um, it is like you know it, is, it has been ticking my head by the time i left that art gallery and uh, i would certainly like to ask you you know as Growing up in India, particularly, or otherwise also, I don't know, but then growing up, in, growing up in India, particularly, you have been always said to be a doctor, engineer, or for that matter, a lawyer, a chartered accountant. But it has never been taught that, uh, you know, take art as a major, something you can be a fantastic artist. And when I, when I was reading and researching about you two, I did see a certain amount of hope that, okay, this is possible. Maybe I was not at the right place at the right time. And that's why I'm a chartered accountant and company secretary for that matter. But uh, how does this happen for you? If you could share some some of the, you know, initial phases when you started on this journey, particularly. Do you want to go first, Jeff? Or... No, I'm an outsider. It says, I mean, I've been, I'm, obviously, I'm a foreigner, I've been, but I've been engaged with India for over 40 years. And uh, I was an art historian before I got here. And, and you know, it's, it's the, the art and the architecture that first uh, grabbed my attention. But if, um, 
at the risk of sounding like you know the the um, over critical um, foreign voice. Yes, I do think that education in the history of art is very still uh, as yet very underdeveloped in this country. There are a few centers of excellence, but only a few. Um, so I would like to see that that develop. I think particularly with the the growth in liberal arts in the private university sector in the last decade and a half or last decade or two, um, there's 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 room for hope there. Um, but as Minani was educated in this country initially, um, although she now works for a foreign university, perhaps she can tell the counterpart to that story. Well, I think, um, I mean, you know, we, we all need chartered accountants and company secretaries. So it's not to say that, the, the, or, and doctors, heaven's sake, doctors in the last two years, we've, we've really benefited to, to the extent that we have from, from those kinds of prof professions. So it's not to say that those things are unimportant or valueless, uh, quite the contrary. And actually, I think, um, more than uh, uh, thinking of it in terms of one to the exclusion of other things, I think it would be more meaningful to include art as a part of everyone's life, that you don't have to study art and become an artist. You can still become a CA, um, but you know, having that appreciation I think, uh, uh, you know, or introduction or familiarity, it just means that one doesn't feel weird going into a gallery or one doesn't feel scared to like something or think about something because you know one's done it as a child. Uh, and also it's, I think it's important to recognize that, that uh, you know, I, I'm a kind of urban educated elite sort of person in the sense that you know, um, there are people from all sorts of different backgrounds in India um, and, and people in many ways who may not be financially well off. I mean, I don't mean to romanticize po poverty, that's not my point, but Nevertheless, um, uh, you know, uh, art, the talent for it and an appreciation for it can happen anywhere. You, you know, it, it's not necessarily only for, for people going through the courses or whatever that 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 uh, connection uh, can be made. Um, but yeah, I think for me, it's, it's I was lucky in the sense that my parents were very supportive and said, do whatever you like, as long as you I was fortunate to, to be able to pursue the, the work and the, 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 the courses or whatever that, that I loved and that I was interested in, um, which, because of course, parents do have an important role, in, in, especially in South Asia, because everybody's like the doctor, nurse, whatever, engineer staff come, a lot of it comes yeah. from parents. Um, and so I think that's, that's, that's a hugely important uh, uh, aspect of it. Um, but at the same time, uh, I don't think that the answer is necessarily about um, uh, uh, making art courses viable careers, but making art an integral part of all careers and all sure. of life. And, and of all disciplines. Um, yeah. I had a former st student who now, now works for the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, and her original engagement there was to try to engage all of the faculty of Oxford University to use the collections of the Ashmolean in their teaching, even the physics department, you know, the, we have the historical instruments and so on. And I do think that that's, that's something that, that, that uh, there is scope for work on um, across India to teach history in particular um, through museum collections rather than just from, from textbooks, because museums, by the very diversity of their objects, show you how complex and rich history really is, rather than the sometimes rather simplistic narratives that are served up. And so it, it, it genuinely has, they have an opportunity to make the subject more engaging, and more complex, um, and more satisfying. Um, I'd like to see a lot more of that. I've seen a lot more teaching in, in taking place in museums, school teaching. Very true. You know, it should not, uh, um, you know, there are two changes. I. Um, I, you know, I brought after uh, reading this book and after reading about you two, the first one is there is an easel board in my room next to my um, next to my reading shelf. There is an easel bowl now in my room. And also I like what Giles was mentioning that uh, history being taught. One of my favorite subject was history in my school times. And somehow over the years that got, you know, somehow lost in transition over the years over the academic roles and now it becomes now it is becoming an essential part of my everyday read and everyday thought process so i would like to say thank you so much for putting this book 
putting this phenomenal book, uh, you know, in the rightful uh, direction that it intrigues. It piques my intrigues, uh, interest that uh, everything what you see has a history, has a phenomenal history behind it, and that history is what makes it uh, enriching and experience altogether. Thank you so much for accepting our invite and being here. Thanks for having me. Thank, Thank you so much.